The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. If solving the housing affordability crisis in Ontario requires bold, big solutions, does it mean it won't be solved? Tonight, we'll assess recommendations presented this month to the provincial government and whether any of it is politically viable. First up, a conversation with the former head of the Bank of Canada, Stephen Polaz, about why his new book focuses squarely on adapting to economic risk and uncertain times. It's Monday, February 28th, and that's next on The Agenda. Serving as the ninth governor of the Bank of Canada, economist Stephen Polaz steered monetary policy through some turbulent times under prime ministers from different parties and as Brexit and U.S. President Donald Trump shook up the international economic order. It's not a leap then to see where his interest came in writing his new book. It's called The Next Age of Uncertainty, How the World Can Adapt to a Riskier Future. And Stephen Polaz joins us now from the nation's capital for more. Governor? Do I still call you Governor? Well, how about I just call you Mr. Polas? Welcome to TVO. It's good to have you here. It's a pleasure to be here, Steve. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, let's just start with the intro of the book right off the top here, because you do write that economic forecasting is a bit like driving a car that is in such disrepair that all you can say is that it's probably going to move forward, but there's also a chance it'll suddenly veer to the left or to the right. I think we all mm -hmm. know that feeling. Tell us then, why is it so difficult to make economic forecasts that are accurate? Well, uh, the, the economic system is in incredibly complex, Steve. Um, the models that economists use to try to reduce it down to something that they can understand and manage are huge abstractions. They really don't capture the kind of details uh, that we need. And so they, they work for a while, and they work until they don't, basically, until something else happens that's not really in the model. And of course, in fact, that's happening all the time. So I've always been a bit of a skeptic when it comes to forecasting. I was a forecaster myself for many years. And so I always treated it with enough skepticism that I knew there was going to be many more possibilities. And so like weather forecasters, um, economists, I think, over time are going to drift into a world where they use more than one model, which emphasize completely different things, and then generate more of a cloud of possibilities for the future. You talk um, about a bunch of weather forecasts. Sorry, weather forecasters have become extremely good at their craft. You may have noticed that they're like to the hour, and that's because of this uh, this change in methodology. Right. You you um, you talk in the book about tectonic forces that are you know sort mm. of shaking up the world and making it very difficult to do the job that you guys do. What are the tectonic forces as you look at the world today that you're most concerned about? Well, these things are things we all know about. For example, population aging. Uh, we, it can't be it can't be more practical than that. Uh, population aging is always there, but it's really aging fast now because 50 years ago, back after the post-war period, what we had was a really rapid increase in people. Those people are now retiring. Technological progress, which is there all the time, but it goes in these big waves. We've had three major waves in, in human history, three industrial revolutions, and we believe we're on it's just beginning a new one, which is the, the move to in, in, in artificial intelligence and uh, digitalization of everything we do. Growing income inequality is my third major force. This is, always comes hand in hand with technological change, and we see plenty of evidence of that today. Rising debt, we've talked about that for the past number of years, but of course, it exploded during the pandemic, especially government debt. And so we have a legacy there, which is, creates a force which will be continue to act uh, throughout the future. And the one everybody's talking about is climate change. Climate change, uh, of course, is now producing this uh, forced transition between now and 2050. And that will be a whole layer of structural uncertainty on the economy. Now, each of these things is a personal thing, Steve. Each one of those things has personal effects. Anything that matters to people matters to politicians. And what that does, it means that the, those issues become political issues. And what happens then is they tend to polarize people. People have very strong views about some of these things. Some feel they, they've been left out. Political polarization always comes with rising income inequality and technological change, and it makes it really hard for governments to make decisions. Well, and then 
just when you think you, you may have those tectonic shifts figured out, Vladimir Putin decides to invade his neighbor, and that sends economic forces completely kaflooey. How do we figure all that out? Well, indeed. I mean, that's, uh, that's kind of a reminder, if you like, that we actually are surrounded by, by fragilities, whether they're economic, financial, or geopolitical. Uh, some of those could be completely off the charts, uh, sort of a black swan, even though you might have seen the Russian-Ukraine thing coming. Of course, when it actually happens, like an earthquake, it's, it's totally unpredictable when it happens. So uh, when it does happen, it creates these, these ripples throughout the system, which will go on for a very long time. And, uh, and we are not really that well prepared to deal with risk. I believe that these tectonic forces we've talked about, which, of course, as I said, layer up into politics and geopolitics, those forces are going to combine and magnify one another in unpredictable ways, things that our models will not be able to handle. And those, un those events of unpredictability are things like major outbursts of inflation or depressions in the past, which the same forces produced. Uh, so I think we're in for more and more volatility as a result of this, and we are not well prepared for it. One of your mandates, as you've explained it, obviously, is to make sure that you take a lot of the, the shocks out of the economy, that you try to keep inflation at a relatively even level. Target mm -hmm. is 2%. Maximum employment is also part of your mission. But inflation in the country is currently at 5%. Mm -hmm. And if you've got this whole infrastructure of economists and advisors and so on at the Bank of Canada, whose job it is to keep inflation at 2%, and you guys were, you know, pretty good at it for several decades in a row there... How did it get to five? <laughs> well, you know, it always sounds easier than it really is. Uh, this almost sounds mechanical to people. Uh, you see inflation go up, you do something to make it go back down. But in fact, there's actually a pretty long lag between when a central bank takes an action and when it shows up in inflation. Uh, usually, actually, one and a half years or perhaps as long as two years between when the bank moves interest rates and when inflation actually reacts. So that means you can't, you can't, uh, essentially you would be looking in the rear view mirror and driving your car, uh, you know, to be reacting to inflation today. What you have to do is look forward and say, well, what's inflation going to be two years from now? Oh, is it going to be too high? That means I need to raise interest rates today to offset that and make sure it doesn't become too high. Well, that re relies on a really good forecast of the economy, which is subject to the vagaries we just discussed. It is a really hard job. Uh, there are many, many things between an interest rate movement and its ultimate effect on inflation. And each of those relationships is just something that we model on average. And any day or any month, it could behave differently than in the past. So I don't, I, you shouldn't think of it as a really easy job. Now, how did it get to 5%? Well, many of that's kind of, those things are kind of accidental, Steve. I mean, the fact is that when we, when we hit the, uh, the pandemic, prices began to fall. We were at a risk of deflation. When deflation interacts with high debt, that's where depressions come from. That was a very real risk in the, in the middle of that pandemic. Offsetting that was a major success. When it's all over, then you're kind of mopping up, you know, like a firefighter has done their job, then they clean up. Well, afterwards, then what happens is things go back to normal. So prices went down, then they went back up. So it looks like inflation as they go back up. Supply chain issues emerged. That was unexpected. That adds to pricing. And then, of course, oil prices recovered and more than recovered. So that adds to inflation. So some of these things are unpredictable. Many of them should be transitory. And so I'm expecting inflation to decelerate throughout 2022. We'll have to see. We like charts on this program. You like charts in your old job. So let's share one with our viewers and listeners right now. This is a chart that shows household wealth distribution in Canada in the fourth quarter of 2020. So the pandemic has already hit and has been on, as it were, for several months. And uh, just for those who are listening on podcast and can't see the chart, let me describe the fact that about two-thirds uh, of the household wealth is held among the top 20% in Canada. The middle 40% have 30%, so disproportionately less, and the bottom 40% have only 2.5% of the household mm -hmm. wealth in the country. Obviously, I don't know if this was your intention at the Bank of Canada, but do you think the Bank of Canada recognizes the role that it did play, along with other central banks, in 
potentially helping the wealthiest among us get even wealthier over the last few years that this pandemic has been a scourge in our lives. Yeah, so uh, for sure, the, what's behind uh, that chart is mostly housing. Uh, the, 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 four, the bottom 40% are those people who do not uh, own uh, any, any real estate and therefore do not benefit from the rise in real estate prices. There are, of course, also stocks and uh, other investments which are also concentrated at the top. Also, uh, things that went up in price during the pandemic. Uh, that means that wealth went up, uh, you know, for the economy as a whole, but it's concentrated in those who actually hold uh, those kinds of assets. And I understand that. Um, I'm often asked about this, frankly, and uh, and so I ask, well, what is at the root of that? Well, people say, well, it's because you cut interest rates really low, basically to zero, and that caused this to happen. And I say, yeah, but why did I cut interest rates uh, to zero? Well, because I was trying to protect the economy from the second Great Depression. Now, if we asked ourselves, what would happen if we didn't do those things? Uh, the metaphor I like to use is if you go to your doctor and he says, Steve, you need you need uh, surgery, otherwise you're going to die. He said, well I, well, I guess we'll do the surgery, but is it going to hurt? And the doctor says, well, of course it's going to hurt, but it'll save your life. Well, okay, now let's look at this. We're going to have the second Great Depression if we do nothing. We do what we do, and of course it has side effects just like the pain from the surgery. And those side effects are things like income and wealth distribution get affected during that transition. That's a price we have to pay in order to offset that major disturbance, which could have affected everybody. In the Great Depression, you know, 30% unemployment and, uh, and so on, okay? These are really bad ep episodes in our history and better policymaking prevents them. But it, it does produce side effects, which I understand. But those are second order issues compared to the big one. And I presume it's also your position that there are governments that are certainly within their rights to take decisions which would bevel the edges of the effects of your policy decisions. Is that fair to say? Exactly right. You're, you're asking a fiscal question, uh, which would be a democratically supported uh, policy, which, uh, which addresses these issues. Canada has a good progressive income tax system, and in fact, uh, out of you know something like 70% of the global the world's citizens have seen a, de uh, a deterioration in income distribution, okay, in, in income inequality over the last 10 years. But Canada is not among them. Canada has actually improved its income distribution uh, in the last six, seven years. Well, well, okay, that's that's income as opposed to what you are addressing as wealth, which is which is a sharper edge. But in all those the cases, it is about uh, the government's fiscal policy, which has the power to redistribute income. <clears throat> excuse me, in ways you know, making a more progressive tax system or one-time tax changes in order to uh, adjust this. Uh, just to remind you that one of the forces I talked about as as the the fourth industrial revolution. Rising income inequality always comes with a major uptick in technology. So it's going to be a trend line, not just a situation. And this is a global trend line. It's going to be something that income inequality will be on a rising trend uh, over the next five to 10 years, unless we make something different in our policies in order to, uh, to correct some of that, as you say, around the edges. I know you're a fan of Downton Abbey, that great British television program, because you mention it so often in your book. And um, it sort of reminded me of the time, I think almost a decade ago, that we had the American writer and academic Michael Lind on our program talking about the future of work. Here's a clip of what he had to say then, and then we'll come back and chat about what he had to say. What we're seeing uh, in the United States and in other developed countries is most of the jobs being created are in non-traded domestic service jobs, many of them fairly uh, poorly paid, uh, nursing aides, for example, uh, uh, or uh, uh, janitors, uh, daycare uh, personnel. Uh, it is a political question whether these jobs, which cannot be automated and cannot be outsourced, uh, pay middle-class wages or not. And, and uh, different societies uh, organize themselves differently. So you can have one country in the 21st century where it has a sort of Downton Abbey class hierarchy where most of the people are servants for a few rich owners of the robot factories. You could have another social democratic country where the people who are the working poor in a country like the United States, uh, say the nursing aides, uh, have, are, are part of a prosperous middle class. Do you think Canada is headed towards a Downton Abbey style of society? 
Uh, well, that's a pretty that's a pretty uh, deep question, but I do think, as I've just said, that the trend that will come with the fourth industrial revolution will exaggerate the uh, income inequality that we see today. The reason that happens is because when you have a new technology, economists think of new technology spreading to everybody like yeast. Uh, but what it actually looks like is more like mushrooms, okay? The, 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 the benefits from the technology pop up and the companies that invented the technology or deployed it first can, can grab the mushrooms. But importantly, the second round is when the, the, the people who make out uh, well uh, in that first phase begin to spend their money. And what that does is it creates jobs across not just the new sector, not just in the sectors just mentioned in the clip, but across all sectors. So take, for instance, you know, you continue to buy more houses because people have more incomes. Well, as you buy more houses, that creates all kinds of jobs in the service sector that are well-paid, plumbers, electricians, uh, furnace technicians, you name it, anything related to the home, uh, those jobs all continue to grow. Now, will anybody believe me when they say, and I say well, that new job for the, that person who renovates your kitchen is being created because of the new technology? It seems like a stretch to think of it that far away, but I assure you that is exactly what happens. So in the end, yes, uh, when you have this uh, increasing disparity in incomes, there are more than one way to, to tackle it. Things like guaranteed basic incomes, you know, those, those kinds of things, or as the as the clip suggested, possibly a higher minimum wage uh, for those folks who are doing essential work. Uh, I think what's going to happen in the next five to ten years is there's going to be a shortage of workers, Steve. And I do think that the power in the marketplace is going to shift from employer to employee, and so we will see better compensation and we'll see a, a wider range of types of compensation that helps people address the risks that they face in everyday life. Well, let me pick up on the housing comment that you just made, because, of course, by keeping interest rates as low as you did over the past many years, you did allow people who were able to to get into the housing market in a major way, uh, which sent, of course, housing prices through the roof. And now, you know, we've got a situation where lots of millennials and Gen Zs say, we'll never get into the housing market until our parents die and leave us some money. Do you think that's a, like, is that a reasonable policy prescription for the Bank of Canada and or the government of Canada to take that a whole generation of people are going to have to depend on their parents dying before they can get into the housing market? Well, you put it in a, in a very uh, severe way, but I would say, uh, first of all, it goes back to that uh, metaphor I used before which is when you cut interest rates in order to buffer the effects of a, a major shock to the economy, your hope is that those lower interest rates will cause people to actually borrow and spend money, both companies, perhaps an in investment. That's hard to do in the middle of a recession or, or a contraction of the economy. But the other major transmission channel is housing that regular uh, people who have been waiting some, to someday buy a house accelerate those plans because of those lower interest rates. So it is literally a planned part of the transmission mechanism to try to boost the economy in certain sectors while other sectors are suffering to try to, to ride out uh, that, that decline. So it's intended. Now, you know, you can afterwards say, well, we wish it didn't happen quite like that, but since it had to happen, it had to happen in that way. Uh, is it right? Well, uh, in the end, uh, what I think is going to happen is that, yes, you're right that accessibility of housing is becoming a problem in many of our major cities. Uh, I understand that perfectly. So what ha does happen? Is it the case that people can only rent and hope and wait until someday mom and dad leave them the house? Uh, that may be a life plan for some people. Others uh, may find other ways. We may have financial innovation. We may find lenders who are willing to um, co-own houses with people. We may have companies who are willing to make housing or housing risk part of their compensation policies. So lots of innovation can happen in the economy, but especially financial intermediation. Right now, we still have a kind of a depression mentality around housing. You're supposed to have a big down payment. You're supposed to take 25 or 30 years to pay for your house, and then you own it, and then you retire. Uh, well, you know, if the house is $1.5 million as opposed to $500,000, those two plans don't look the same to the average worker. 
And that's what happens, say, between a place like Moncton versus Toronto, just to take an example. Mm -hmm. So what we need is, is investors who are prepared to allow those folks in Toronto to own a share of their home while the investor owns the rest of the home. And then, and then they can build up the same amount of equity as the family down in Moncton. I think that that's the sort of life plan we should be able to achieve. We have the best banking system on earth. Do you think, though, that we're in a, just one more on this housing issue, do you think we're into a perpetual situation whereby the Bank of Canada, for reasons you've explained, completely understandable, has put forward a, a policy, an interest rate policy that has resulted in the housing market going through the roof, and you've now got politicians who are trying to come up with housing programs that give access to people who can't get into the housing market, an ability to do so, and they're never really successfully able to keep up. Right? There's lots of housing policy programs out there, and they just don't seem to be able to do the job because the market forces yeah. are so tough otherwise. Is this a cycle yeah. we're into for the foreseeable future? I don't think so, uh, because what you've just laid out is a premise that it's all because of low interest rates, and I think it isn't. Uh, if it is because of low interest rates, then as interest rates uh, move back to a more normal level over the next, I don't know, year or two, well, that will unwind some of the effect that you're talking about. But I think the most important thing that's pushed housing prices higher has been excess demand for houses. We are having over 400,000 people, new people arriving in Canada every year and not building enough dwellings for them to live in. This is going to be push up prices uh, well, perpetually if, we, if that's our growth model, which I fully expect it will be. Well, so as identified the Ontario Task Force on, on housing that was just published a couple of weeks ago, the most important thing is going to happen here is we need to boost supply of housing. And that means addressing things like red tape or other zoning restrictions. Uh, in order to uh, improve that supply, there's a ready market there. So developers surely would be ready to do this. They will make money. Uh, people will get their housing aspirations fulfilled. This can be done. Uh, but we need to get our sleeves rolled up and fix the rule book uh, around housing for to have any hope that supply will meet demand. But even if supply met demand perfectly, Steve, I just want to remind everybody that the price of existing homes would still keep going up all the time. As cities get bigger, what happens is you get a little further from the center, a little further from the center, time is money. You got to get on in your car or on the bus or whatever it is you do to get downtown. Well, you're always going to be willing to pay just a little more to be a little closer. Okay, so the bigger a city gets, the more expensive it becomes. That is mother nature at work. Um, and so we do need to explore every one of these possibilities in order to solve this for, as a society. Let me ask you one last question, and that is, I know from having read the book that you love President Jed Bartlett, who unfortunately <laughs> is not a real guy. That's who Martin Sheen played in The West Wing. Do yeah. you see... Any politician out there, male or female, who, who's got the Bartlett qualities that you think could really make a great contribution to our society? Well, Jed Bartlett is written as a perfect yet fallible character. So he's a very human character. Uh, it's, he's masterfully written. Uh, and that's why there's so many, I think, leadership lessons for people who are, are want to be leaders, who are our leaders. The same thing with Jean-Luc Picard in Star Trek, uh, The Next Generation. So let's just set that aside for a moment. Do we have that sort of ideal reader? Of course not. That's, that's, what's, that's, that's made up. Uh, do I see signs of that? In, at times. At times when, when things happen, you think, now that's what I've been watching for. But in generally speaking, no. I'm afraid that our, our political class is, is, I think politics is the hardest job on earth, Steve. You know, it, it looks hard on the West Wing, but in real life, my goodness, I've seen it up close. It is the most difficult job there is. And it's going to get harder as that polarization increases, which is being driven by economic factors. Uh, so I don't, I'm not confident that we're going to find it so, you know, like on TV, to get these compromises worked out and get the job done. I think in the end, uh, the residual uncertainty that we face, we're going to face it ourselves and our companies will face it. That's Stephen Polaz, the ninth governor of the Bank of Canada, author of The Next Age of Uncertainty, How the World Can Adapt to a Riskier Future. And Governor, it's been good of you to join us here on TVO tonight. Many thanks. My pleasure. Thanks, Steve.
The cost of housing in Ontario far outstripped income gains over the past decade, leading to what's widely seen as a crisis. The Ontario Housing Affordability Task Force's recent report offers 55 recommendations urging sweeping action and immediate action. But big thinking can lead to big pushback. With us now on whether any of those suggestions have a chance of becoming policy, we welcome from the nation's capital in the Glebe economist Mike Moffat, Senior Director at the Smart Prosperity Think Tank and an Assistant Professor at Western University's Ivy Business School. In Port Hope, Ontario, Alison Smith, Assistant Professor of Political Science at the University of Toronto. And in Corktown, in the provincial capital, Eric Lombardi, founder of the volunteer housing advocacy group More Neighbours Toronto. And it's good to have you three on our program tonight. Uh, you just heard the former governor of the Bank of Canada and um, our conversation about his new book. And I thought maybe we'd just start by having each of you pluck one thing from that interview that you found noteworthy. Mike, start us off. Well, I, I don't know if it's uh, going to be helpful to tell generations that they're going to have to, future generations, that they're going to have to get uh, investors in buying their homes and only going to be owning a, a, a small piece of it. I think, you know, the, the point about progress is that things are supposed to get better. And I, I, I question whether or not that is a politically sustainable solution to say, OK, you can only own a chunk of your home and some faraway investor is going to own the rest. Well, he's not a politician. Remember that, right? No. Yeah. No, that is okay. that is true. That is true. But I think we may have uh, a policy revolt. Uh, you know, if that is seen to be the the solution to the problem. Allison, how about for you? Um, I do have to say, I was interested in his um, analysis of Jed Bartlett as a <laughs> as a politician, and whether we have a Jed Bartlett to lead us through this next uh, pandemic recovery and everything. Um, I think I agree with Mike in terms of the, the the options that are on the table for millennials and Gen Z, that partnering with investors or private sector developers as moving toward home ownership is what is sort of what that generation can look forward to. Canadian In Canadian housing policy history, there have been periods where interest rates have gone up significantly. In the 1970s, that was the case. And rather than looking to partner and share equity with private sector um, investors or developers, the government invest, invested and provided interest rate subsidies to households, to not just low income households, but medium income households, and also subsidized the development of rental housing. So there's other solutions that are on the table. But what I think is interesting about the conversation we're having right now is it really is about restraining government involvement. And I'm not sure that enough progress is going to be made in addressing the housing crisis by really looking to limit government involvement everywhere that we can. There are other options that are available. Okay, Eric, what would you pluck out of the interview? Yeah, what struck, struck me was the same way as what struck Mike, is the idea that future generations have shared ownership to look forward to. I think, you know, especially in the Globe and Mail piece that he put out this weekend as well, where he expressed that he did not know, and the economists don't know, what the optimal price of housing should be. It doesn't really matter what, you know, the economics says what the optimal price of housing should be, because we can choose to make an objective as a society that housing costs should be lower, and we can use various tools at our disposal, from market-oriented tools on the supply side, to direct government investment in creating affordable housing, to demand-side actions that clamp down on speculation. But in principle, we can say, as a society, we want housing prices to be lower, we want them to be attainable to middle-class and working-class families. So the question is not, what is the optimal price? The, the question is, what is the optimal strategy from a policy perspective to allow us to achieve that outcome of lower housing costs broadly. Uh, and I think the task force report is, you know, in general, the very first step, a necessary step, but on its own insufficient to achieving that goal. Well, Eric, that's a beautiful segue to take us to where we need to go now because we do want to focus on this Ontario Affordability Task Force report, 33 pages, chock full of recommendations, as we suggested in the intro, to increase the housing supply in the province of Ontario. And I'll ask our director, Sheldon Osmond, to bring up this graphic here so we can go through some of them. Uh, for example, adding 1.5 million homes to the supply over the next 10 years, that's the mission, create, quote unquote, as of right zoning, instead of exclusionary zoning. We'll get into that in a moment. Depoliticize the process of getting density built. Remove or reduce parking requirements. 
and prevent appeals that are purely aimed at delaying projects. We see a lot of that these days. All right, let's start with this. Mike, overall impressions of these recommendations. What do you think? I think overall they're they're fantastic. Now, I would say that the task force had a very limited mandate that they weren't looking at uh, affordable housing or purpose for the most part purpose built rental or or speculation, but what they've uh, what they've got here is a fantastic start of getting more uh, housing, more what I would call family friendly, climate friendly housing built in our city. So overall, I think they've done a fantastic job with Allison, with the limited mandate that they have. Understood. Allison, you being the political scientist, I'm going to ask you this question. Do you think these are politically viable recommendations? Um, so the Canadian Federation is interesting where sometimes we have a situation where one level of government will kind of go beyond what its mandate is or what its mandate normally is to sort of get another gut level of government to do something that it can't achieve on its own. We saw this, for example, in Vancouver, where um, there were no limits on campaign spending and municipal actors basically asked the province to implement limits because it wasn't possible for local actors to do so. And I hear federal officials say this sometimes too, that provinces will publicly disagree with something that the federal government is doing, but behind the scenes will say thank you for making us do that because it gives us a little bit of cover. And so in this sense, that might be what the province is um, is doing. It's, it's appealing to some of the people who I think um, are supporting Ford. You know, this is the party of the social housing boondoggle. We don't want to increase government investment, but rather create more space for the private sector. So in a sense, it aligns with the provincial government's approach to housing historically and approach to social protection, while also, you know, really being a very interesting proposal for people living in urban centers who want more density but aren't able to achieve it because the way the system is set up, there's a lot of barriers. You know, they say it's too hard to build housing, it's too easy to oppose housing. So here the province is taking a little bit of heat off of the municipality. So in that sense, if the province decides to go ahead with it, you know, this is just a report, um, we don't know that they will or not, but if the province decides to go ahead with it, I think it opens up a lot more opportunities at the local level and does kind of take some heat off of local councillors and the mayor who may actually agree that this is a good way to go with housing. Mike, uh, I know you're not a political scientist, but you hang out with politicians from time to time and watch what they do. So maybe you could tell us in your judgment which of the recommendations you think is the politically most tricky. I think the one that's most tricky, or the one that's going to get the biggest bun fight, is the ones around waiving development charges and, and things like that. That I agree that a lot of these uh, recommendations give uh, political cover to municipalities who, you know, may may think that these policies are, are a good idea, but have trouble convincing people. Ford's taken those off their hands. But anything where the province is basically costing the municipality a significant amount of money, I think you're going to get some fight there. And, uh, you know, the municipalities are going to ask the province to be made whole. And we'll have to see whether or not uh, the Ford government is willing to do that. Now, Eric, the title of your group uh, is somewhat self-explanatory, More Neighbors Toronto. Uh, but maybe you could go just sort of one level deeper and tell us what your mission is. Our mission is to get the policy reforms necessary to end the housing crisis, both now but to prevent future housing crises from occurring in the future. The reality is we don't know exactly whether or not this crisis is a, bu a bubble or actually based on real fundamentals. But when it comes to policy reform, there are really three pillars to getting what we need. We need more private market supply. We more, need more direct government subsidization of affordable and purpose-built rentals. And we also need some demand-side measures that um, overall prevent bad behavior in the markets from driving up the costs of housing. Um, and then within all of that, there are lots of reforms that help everything uh, involved with that. And so what we're really trying to push for is the government reforms required to achieve those goals. And one of the ways that we do that is by showing up to conversations about housing in Toronto, which have been historically dominated by famously uh, the not in my backyard uh, local neighbors and communities who, who really don't understand how opposing housing in their communities is actually creating this crisis. And so we organize people to show up and say, yeah, future residents matter. These homes are helpful for people and people deserve to live in 
in Toronto and in, in neighborhoods. Now, Eric, when you say we, who's we? Who's in your group? Uh, I'd say our group is actually very broad, but in, in general, it is uh, young people under the age of 40, uh, many of whom either rent or own, uh, who are thinking about, you know, what do you want in life, like families, ownership, et cetera, and finding that Toronto uh, and communities in the GTA that they've grown up in are now totally inaccessible to them. And, you know, a lot of them are, have to make sacrifices in terms of, you know, will I be able to have the number of kids that I want? Or will I be able to live somewhere where I have job viable options within a reasonable distance, right? Should I be looking at remote options? And for me personally, as someone who studied engineering, uh, a lot of my friends moved to the States uh, to, to get jobs because it's just not attainable here anymore. And for, for us, we see this crisis as something that is fundamental to solving or else we're looking at a much worse future in the GTA than it should otherwise be. Now, Mike, as you listen to the mission of Eric's group, I wonder whether you think um, his policy prescriptions are too interventionist for a conservative government to embrace. What do you think? Uh, I, I don't think they are at all. Um, that there are, you know, some where it's, you know, more more government spending. Obviously, you're going to have a little bit more of a pushback from the government. But a lot of this is, uh, a lot of this is government doing less. You know, getting getting less in the way. Uh, you know, less red tape and that kind of thing. And we are we are going to need uh, solutions that cover the ideological spectrum. You know, sometimes it's going to be less government, and sometimes it's going to be more government. And and we need to we need to be very pragmatic about it and not you know not have ideological blinders okay having said that Allison maybe you could pick up the story from this standpoint we know uh, because these donations are made public that uh, property developers are among the most significant contributors both municipally and provincially uh, to campaigns and I wonder whether it's really possible to divorce a good public policy planning as it relates to housing policy from what those who pay the piper and maybe occasionally call the tune would like. I mean, I think a really good example of that is Ontario's refusal to allow municipalities to, um, or to download inclusionary zoning powers to municipalities. BC municipalities have had that power since the 1970s and have used inclusionary zoning to mandate the contribution of affordable housing in new private sector developments. And that has been a power in BC since the 1970s. There are very close relationships municipally and provincially between politicians and developers. But I think in Ontario, because that power was not devolved earlier, the reluctance to download that policy, I think, speaks to the fact that that, that, that takes from developers' uh, profit. It's it's really um, unfair to municipalities, actually, that the province has held on to that particular power for so long after being the only province in the Canadian Federation to download housing responsibility to municipalities in the late 1990s in the local services realignment, but didn't also download inclusionary zoning, which would have allowed municipalities to actually contribute a little bit more to affordable housing, nowhere near what's needed, but still could have made some contributions. And so I think that the relationship between developers and politicians is close. And I think that the fact that this task force has made these recommendations specifically regarding zoning, that tells me that developers do actually have an interest in this type of um, taking, getting out of the way of what they're able to do, of where they're able to build and what they're able to build. Um, and you just need to look at the, the composition of the task force and the recommendations that they made to sort of conclude that this is, you know, this is a good opportunity to contribute to the missing middle. Um, but it is also something that private sector developers are interested in. There may be some overlap in terms of who's benefiting here, though. Uh, Eric, can I get you to weigh in on the relationship between governments, plural, and the development industry? Yeah. I mean, just like any industry, there's going to be relationships between the development community and uh, the government. And, you know, frankly, some developers and the way that they've behaved over the last couple of decades have earned them their bad reputations. But that doesn't actually go for everyone. And everyone reacts to the incentives that are available in the market. And in Toronto and the GTA, the incentive that they're reacting to is the fact that land is unavailable and scarce. And so the reliability of that scarcity is enabling bad actors, for example, sit on land that could otherwise be developed. Um, but what these task force recommendations actually do is alleviate that 
land scarcity by opening up more neighborhood more neighborhoods mm -hmm. to smaller forms of development. And what you'll actually see happen is smaller developers and new entrepreneurs enter that space. Families taking on renovations to turn a house into maybe two houses. And the cost basis for doing a lot of these things is lower. And so from my perspective, the additional competition will be welcomed by some in the development community who really want to make money off of building more homes versus others who are speculating on land and want to make their profits on margin. And so I don't think the development community is as ideologically aligned um, as, as implied. And I don't think the task force recommendations are as associated with pure development industry interests, whatever that actually means, as, as some opponents of it are making it out to be. Okay, before we pursue those ideas, Mike, can I just get you to weigh in on this um, uh, political donation relationship between uh, what uh, developers give and what they feel they're therefore entitled to in terms of provincial policy? Well, I, I certainly think that that's an issue, and uh, you know we have to look. That, that there's three broad groups here, right? There's the there's the landowners, there's the developers, and the the home builders, and all three groups are big donors, but they're not necessarily aligned with each other, have the same interests, and even within the groups, um, you know, you could have uh, you know some some wanting to build more others wanting to build less to, to keep prices high. But I think furthermore, we have to remember that uh, when we look at municipal politics, um, you know, there's a lot of donations there. And a lot of those donations uh, come from existing homeowners who don't want change in their neighborhood. So, you know, it's not just the, the, the forces of change who are donating to politicians, but it's the forces of not in my backyard who are big political uh, donors, and we have to consider them as well. I thought NIMBY was now not the uh, preferred term anymore. I thought it was banana, which is basically, <laughs> what's banana again? Build absolutely nothing anywhere? Something like that? Anywhere near, near anything. <laughs> near, near anything, right, okay. Um, okay, well, let's, uh, since you put the policy prescriptions on the table now, let's go there. Uh, Mike, if you would, since you had the floor there, as of right zoning, that's one of the recommendations. What is as of right zoning? Well, well, basically, when you uh, if you own an existing house, there are sort of things you can do and things you can't do as as of right. So, for instance, you know, I could basically tear down my house tomorrow as long as I you know get the the permits and uh, you know build a, a McMansion or something like that. But if I wanted to build a, a duplex or a triplex or, or a garden suite, um, oftentimes they would have to go through uh, you know a community process and all my my neighbors would get to veto that. So, so basically, w what this would allow is uh, property owners and landowners a wider, uh, a wider set of options uh, to to build without again having to to go through this community process. And the idea is that that would allow more for you know missing middle developments, allow for more granny suites, al allow for you know getting more out of every piece of land, which is which is absolutely needed in our cities. Eric, I'm trying to imagine how well it would go over with the neighbors, quote unquote, if somebody bought a very large piece of property in, let's say, Rosedale and tore down a big old house and decided to put up four smaller houses or four units in a, in a big place uh, in its place. You'd be able to house more people. How do you think the neighbors would react? The vast majority would not care that much. And I think one of the issues in the conversations that we have about housing is that we highlight the forces and voices of people who are lifelong perpetual complainers who simply reject the idea of change in their neighborhoods. Uh, I do think the vast majority of people would be fine with building more housing in, in their neighborhoods, right? There is a minor inconvenience that comes with construction, but you know, I, I would really say that we listen far too much to those who complain and the vast majority of people in most community meetings about most developments are simply not showing up because they're relatively indifferent to it. And I think that's a really important point that we need to make sure that our politics is really reflective of what neighborhoods think. And most are not as against these type of changes as the NIMBYs would imply. Allison, do you agree with that? <laughs> Yeah, like this is kind of gentle density. This isn't, we're not talking about building big condos or, you know, even 10 unit 
apartment buildings. This is a fairly manageable amount of um, of density that's being added into existing neighborhoods. I do know that there is already a lot of strain in a lot of neighborhoods already. When I lived in in the West End of Toronto, there were so I'll be at condo developments, but condo developments going up. And right next to the advertisements about the condo developments was a posting from the Toronto District School Board saying you are not guaranteed a spot in one of the schools in this ward or in this um, in this neighborhood if you move here because the schools are overflowing. And that's where this you know the 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 point about potentially waiving those different fees, which municipalities will use to invest in social infrastructure, can actually could create some some problems in certain neighborhoods if there aren't if there isn't the social infrastructure to be able to welcome more people into the community. But I think generally adding you know four four units where there was one, adding two units where there was one or three where there was two, that's not a huge inconvenience to the neighborhood life around there. It, it's, it's more in terms of those big condo developments that are going up where I think you might see more um, more opposition. Well, Mike, let me get you to weigh in on that in this respect. Uh, the conventional wisdom is that people who need places to live are all too happy to have neighborhoods change their characteristics in order to accommodate that. And the flip side is, the people who already live in those neighborhoods don't want them to change at all, uh, even though there may be a housing crisis out there. Uh, is that conventional wisdom wrong nowadays? I, I wouldn't say it's wholly wrong, though. As Eric points out, it could be overblown that that most people are indifferent. But but certainly, you know, you can see the you know the the people who believe themselves to be inconvenienced by this will show up. But the people who are inconvenienced by not being able to live in that neighborhood don't show up because those houses aren't built and they're they they don't really know that they're getting uh, blocked out. And I think that's you know to to go back to the task force report, I think that's. You know the sort of brilliance of, of dealing with this at the provincial level, where it takes that sort of local neighborhood politics out of it. It sets a, a baseline minimum standard for all municipalities, so you're not doing this block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood, but instead setting these minimum standards, and you know then it becomes more of a uh, general, uh, you know, general approach rather than you know doing this house by house, which again can uh, engender opposition. All right. In which case, Allison, the provincial election, as we know, is less than 100 days, fewer than 100 days away. Do you see uh, any parties on the spectrum that are embracing these recommendations and uh, thereby intending to run on them when the election campaign is eventually called in May? I mean, that's a tough that's a tough question. There's a lot going on that parties are, are talking about and are not talking about. So I'm not I'm not totally sure where they're currently standing on this. I think the Green Party has tended to have a pretty interventionist approach to housing and one that really does encourage density. Um, oftentimes, I think what the Green Party does in term in its housing policy is sort of adopt aspects of other parties' policies, sort of as a hold you to account kind of thing for what it is that you said you're going to do or what we know some of the solutions are. Um, I think this is you know we're not going to zone our way out of this housing crisis. There is a lot that can be contributed by making changes to zoning, but there's also a huge role for the province. And there's an opportunity here for whether it's partnering with private sector developers to add subsidies for guaranteed affordable housing, increasing, um, increasing rent supplements for people. There's a whole lot of different tools that are available that will not just get at this missing middle, which I feel will, I'm, I'm concerned in the first few years, might be missing upper middle class and won't really affect people at the lower end of the income, spe uh, income spectrum. I think there's room here for this to be one aspect of a party's policy, but maybe from those parties from the left, we might see some more moves to partner to really take advantage of the national housing strategy and the money that's on the table to partner with the municipalities as opposed to just saying, you know, municipalities, you've been making bad decisions, so we're going to come in and fix it and then move back out. That's not going to be what's going to lead to um, the solution across the housing crisis that, that is needed, not just in Toronto, but in places increasingly all across the province as well. Well, let me pick up on that. Eric, to, to the best of your knowledge, are there other jurisdictions in the province of Ontario or, frankly, across the country, which... And let's take the example we've been talking about, which allows somebody to buy a big house in a fancy neighborhood, tear it down and put up a triplex or a you know, four unit house in its place. Not in enough places, but just you know, to comment on this, 
Um, when we look at the politics of housing and how it relates in other places, right? Um, there are markets that are ahead of Toronto and even Canada on a decision-making process, right? You look at New Zealand, that you know the the politics of housing has reached a point such that they're able to secure these reforms. You look at California, you look at Oregon, you look at Massachusetts. So many of these jurisdictions that are facing long-held um, housing crises are now saying, yeah, do you know what? We've recognized that the policies in place, the restrictions and the difficulty of the process is a huge barrier to getting housing of all types created. And so my message to our political leaders is don't hang on to nimbyism. It's become dirty. If you want to win this next election, boldness on this issue will be rewarded, both from a volunteer perspective, but I also think a vote perspective, because these types of reforms are winning elections in places that are like Ontario. And you know, I, when it comes to the political parties, I do think we will see some ambitious proposals, um, especially I think the Ontario Liberal Party will have some. And I think you know, even the PCs and NDP are both weighing right now just how bold that they need to go. And is this issue going to be a winner for them? And okay. in many cases, I think yes. We'll keep our heads up for that. Uh, in our remaining moments here, let's put one more issue on the table, and that is on the issue of mobility. And Mike Moffat, I'm going to start with you again, because I think you've done some work looking at uh, what's been happening in terms of people either coming into or leaving the capital city of the province of Ontario. What have you found? Yeah, well, it, before the year before the pandemic, we saw 60,000 uh, people leave Toronto and Peel on net for other parts of the province. And the most common age for them to leave is zero. That is their kids under 12 months. So <laughs> we've seen this exodus happening uh, before the pandemic of, of basically young families getting priced out. You know, maybe they're living in a 600 square foot condo. They have a baby or babies on the way and they're, the, the, the couple's just like, uh, this ain't gonna work. So they're gonna drive and qualify till they, they find a house. And often it's in a smaller community like Thorold or, or Tilsonburg or, or Lucan. And this is only picked up uh, during the pandemic. So now we're seeing mostly in Toronto, but a little bit in Peel as well, um, missing you know a, a decline in the number of children under the age of five, because again, they, they're kind of spreading out all across Southwestern Ontario. Should that, Allison, be of concern? Um, I'm, you know, yeah, it should be if people are, if families are leaving, there's a lot um, that families can contribute and a lot that families um, can gain from living in an urban center. You know, the one thing we are, we, I moved from Toronto to Port Hope. Uh, my children were older than zero. They were two and four when we did. And there's a number of reasons why we left. Um, but I think like childcare is also a, a, a crushing cost in Toronto. And when you have um, a baby and you're looking at the wait lists for childcare and you're looking at the costs of childcare, which for an infant can be up to $2,000, $2,500 at minimum uh, currently for childcare, plus you add exorbitant costs for rent. Um, families who are renting homes are constantly living in fear that they might be uh, evicted if the owner moves back in or sells. So I think, I wonder if if Ontario will sign a child care agreement, we are the only province slash territory that hasn't, um, that will take a big burden off of families in the city of Toronto to be able to plan to have to have families to afford housing, maybe if this missing middle comes uh, or if the housing market cools, but then also look at being able to manage the costs that are associated with child care as well, knowing that it's affordable, knowing that they don't need to delay a second child until their oldest is in is in school so they don't have to pay you know two costs of childcare those kind of things so i wonder if that might be if it might be temporary or if there may be more of a longer term trend in terms of people wanting um more house more people being able to work from home those types of changes as well and let me do a quick follow up with you do i infer correctly mm -hmm. that you probably don't have to drive from port hope to toronto for your job 5 days a week anymore not 5 days a week no, um, it would be one or two days. I also teach in Mississauga. So the the nice thing, I grew up in, in the interior of VC where there's no rail transit and Greyhound has been cut. So it's very difficult to transit around that province. So like Southern Ontario is a different situation. There's a via rail stop 
here. There's go trains. So the plan, I, I have a little one who's currently ineligible for vaccination. So I'm being careful in what I'm doing at this moment in time. But there is train transit that I can take to get to downtown or even out to Mississauga. And I'm, I'm fortunate that I can do my job on the train. But even if it was five days a week, that would be that would be too much to be able to manage. So it is um, like a privileged position to be able to work from home most days of the week and then to take transit in when when I'm teaching in person. Right. Eric, let me give the last 30 seconds to you on this. Uh, how much concern do you have about the fact that there is an outflow of people uh, 60,000 net, according to Mike Moffat, nowadays. Families and kids are the future of the city. Um, young people especially are more likely to start businesses. And we actually had a member do an analysis of Toronto District School Board availability. And one of the shocking things is, you know, there's actually a lot of schools uh, in neighborhoods that are shrinking because of these rules that have so much capacity that they are actually at risk of closure. Uh, and that really should not be the case in a city that is supposed to be growing. And so the fact that we see families leaving is not an indictment of life in Toronto. It's an indictment of the unaffordability of life in Toronto. And it should be our goal as a policy outcome to staunch that. Gotcha. Eric Lombardi, Allison Smith, Mike Moffat, it's awfully good of all three of you to join us here on TVO tonight. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And that is the agenda for Monday, February 28th, 2022. As Ontario gets set to drop vaccine passports tomorrow, we'll find out how to contend with doing your own personal risk assessment when going out into the world. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.